So we'll start the webinar uh, with Joel's presentation. Um, and then Joel will talk about um, mechanism of resistance to acaricides in viral destructive populations. And then um, Dr. Uh, Sam, doc, uh, no, I guess Sam will uh, talk after Joel, and Sam will present on data that we collected last year on ATVAR uh, efficacy in Alberta. And Dr. Rasu will follow Sam, and he will talk about the data that we collected last year as well on the mutations in the, the mites uh, that we collected. Uh, in Alberta as well. Um, so just to give kind of brief um, introduction to Dr. Joel Gonzalez Cabrera. Uh, Dr. Joel, he uh, works uh, in Spain. So we're very thankful for you showing up. I know the time uh, time zone is quite different. Um, then we kind of find, found a way to make it okay for everybody. Uh, Dr. Joel is currently based at ERI Biotech Med, University of Valencia in Spain, um, as the holder of Ramon y Cajal contract. Uh, his scientific interest is focusing mainly on the investigation of the mechanisms underlying the evolution of resistance to pesticides and the elucidation of key determinants of their selectivity over non-target organisms. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I will um, just uh, give you the stage, Joel, and uh, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. If not, let me know, and and I can yeah. um, make will, a few changes to allow that. I will do that. I will first do this. Let's see if I can just start with this. Let me open it first. I will move this here, and then. So, do you see my screen now? Uh, yes, yes, we do. Right. Okay. Good. So, I will. I will first start. Uh, thank you. Thanking you for inviting me to be with, uh, with you presenting part of the, <clears throat> of the results we have obtained here in Spain, uh, dealing with the mechanism of resistance to acaricides in, in Barrada structure. This is uh, something that I know is uh, it's a concern and uh, I would like to, to uh, try to put some, some light on, on this today. Uh, first, I want to apologize too, <laughs> because as I am, fluent in English, you will see that I'm sometimes will be struggling with some expressions, but I will do my best. Um, just uh, um, as a presentation, we are based here in Spain, in Valencia, in the Mediterranean coast. Uh, the weather is completely different. We are 20 degrees now, very sun, sunny, sunny day. It's, uh, the sun is shining out there, which is very pleasant. The city is uh, a wonderful city. Uh, uh, very sunny and it's warm or most of, of the times it's very warm and it's a very nice place to be. Uh, we are based uh, uh, very near the city in a campus, very beautiful campus, and we are just in the faculty of biology. I mean at the department of genetics here at the faculty. Right, but let's talk about bees, but more important, I want to talk about uh, Marroa structure, which is uh, as, as you know, it's a very important problem uh, that is causing uh, coloring losses all over the world. It's something that we have here in Spain. It's a very big problem here in Spain, but it's also a problem for almost everyone. As you can see here, it's only second uh, from diseases. But as you know, also Barroa is uh, vectoring most of the viruses causing diseases. So Barroa is actually a very, very important problem. Here in Europe, we have uh, losses medium to high losses of colonies, but it's uh, in very few places above 20%. Although this year, last year, it was particularly bad here in Spain for color losses. In the US, uh, as you might know, the, the losses are very, very high uh, during the winter, 
So after winter, you have uh, in some places more than 50% losses. I found this uh, report from Canada from last year. And it's interesting to see that there, there was a very high increase in the colony losses in Canada after winter, just increasing up to 45% uh, percent of uh, losses, which is very, very, very high. I was not aware of this until I started uh, my work to prepare this presentation. Well, there's many, there's many um, different possibilities to uh, deal with Barro. And, and beekeepers can rely on, on hard agaricides, we can call it this way, also in organic acids, uh, essential oils, and other uh, methodologies to, to deal with the mite. But most of the times, uh, due to their efficacy, the, the ease of use, uh, beekeepers rely on, on hard acaricides. In this case, there are many, three main groups, which is pyrethroids, organophophates, and uh, These are the main groups that are actually um, uh, used for control by raw. But uh, for pyrethroids and organophophates, for a very long time, there are generalized resistance, although in patches, but very, very well distributed all over the place, here in Spain and also in other places, you will see now. Um, and until not so mm, much time, we have no resistance to amitras, but since a uh, year and a half, we are also detecting uh, problems with amitras. Uh, in, in some, some areas. Uh, I will show you some, some of this data later. Uh, but before going that, go, moving to that, um, I would like to show, show some very uh, few slides talking about uh, very general things about pesticides and resistance. Um, how much does a caricide cost? I mean, because here in Spain, and I suppose in other places, uh, beekeepers are always, are always asking for new compounds, new active ingredients, and uh, new ways to actually control the mite. It's very expensive. It's very, very expensive. It's almost an investment of 300 million euros to develop a new pesticide, and it takes almost uh, 11 years to bring this to the market. The success rate is almost 140,000 to one. I mean, you have to test 140,000 compounds to get one that is actually useful for uh, controlling certain pests. It's very, very, very high. So we really need to protect the compounds already in the market, already in use from the phenomenon of resistance. Because once you have resistance, then you are losing your bullets you're actually losing the way to uh, control the, uh, the pest. It's a massive problem. Sometimes it's impossible to control some pests and they, there are millions, millions of dollars in losses. There are almost 600 species already developing resistance. So it's uh, a very high number of species. And it, they, these uh, other ones have developed resistance to almost uh, everything used against them. It's almost impossible, as I said, to control uh, the best in, in, in some cases. But I would like to focus more in this slide, is that resistance is, must be genetic based. You really need changes in the structure of the target site, in the gene expression or, or in the regulation to actually have resistance. If not, the treatment is not working because something else. You really need mutations for uh, talking about, to talk about resistance, you really need mutations. And that's what we are doing. We are actually looking for these mutations. That's the work we are doing on, on this uh, topic. And I will talk about this now. I mean, uh, let's talk about the target site modification because there are four different mechanisms of resistance. But so far in Barroa, we have found only one mechanism. It's the target site modification. This is very specific mechanism of resistance, but the, the bad news 
is that is usually causing the highest level of resistance. Uh, because it's when you change the, the, the very um, target, then the pesticide is not able to actually bind to the, to the target and then it's just useless. Uh, because of this, it's also having a very high risk of growth resistance within the same family of pesticides. And that's why I have this uh, image here. It's, uh, <laughs> I would like to just say that this is a kind of neuron here, and this is another neuron here, neuron here, and this is the synapses. Here we have the sodium channel, which is a molecule that is situated in the axon, and it's happened to be the target of pyrethroids and also DDT, but pyrethroids. Uh, we have here acetylcholinesterase, which is the target for carbamates and organophosphates. And here we have the beta octopamine receptor, which is the target for formamidates. But if I change this, then you have a more clearer picture. The sodium channel is the target of all pyrethroids used against Barot. I mean, tafluvalinate, flumethrin, and acrinathrin, they all bind to the same place. Um, Cumaphos, chlorbenfiphos, and chlorpyrifos, they all bind to the same uh, target, which is acetylcholinesterase. I know chlorpyrifos is not used for controlling Barot, but it's sometimes still used for controlling some agricultural pests. And it's also uh, contributing to the uh, resistance to Cumaphos in case it is still in use. You, we can discuss this about later if you, if you, if you want. Uh, and here we have amidrast, which is so far the only formamidin we have, and it's by, it, this is binding to the uh, beta octopamine receptor. I, I will make some explanation afterwards. Now I will talk about the resistance to pyrethroids, the work we have done uh, to detect the mechanism of resistance to uh, pyrethroids. Uh, this is the voltage gate in sodium channel, which is uh, let's say a very large molecule that is situate, situated, located here in the action of uh, neurons and some other excitable cells that it happen to have a pocket, hydrophobic pocket here where the pyrethroid binds. Here is the pyrethroids. You can see here the pyrethroids. And uh, any change in this area here or in this area here will lead to resistance. If you prevent the pyrethroid to bind, then you will have resistance. This is something like this. I mean, the pyrethroid is just going inside the channel and it's, it binds here and keeps the channel open. The channel is open and then you have a very strong neurotoxic action that it leads to the death of the mite, which is the susceptible mite. But if there is a change here that prevents the pyrethroid to bind, then you will have uh, a resistant mite because the pyrethroid is not able to do the function. Well, we started this work with pyrethroids back in 2009. I've collected some samples in this area here uh, of the UK. And in 2013, we also do some collections too. After that, we brought our sampling to all over Europe uh, in several countries. And with our investigations, we have detected just right here at this position here in the pocket, right in the pocket, a change of oxytocin to, to one in that leads to the change of the amino acid from leucine to valine at position 925 of the sodium channel. And we found a very strong correlation between the mutation and the treatment. I mean, we collected mites uh, surviving the treatment to pyrethroids. I mean, we did this with tafluvalinate, and we also did this with, uh, with uh, flumethrin. And we found that mice surviving the treatment have a very high percentage of homozygous for the mutation, this RR here. And we found that mice coming from non-treated hives, non-treated colonies, sorry, uh, they were almost, all of them were homozygous for the susceptible allele. I mean, uh, there's, this is strong correlation and all the tests we, do, we did just Proof that this mutation is causing, actually causing the resistance to 
pyrethroids in European mites. We also find, sorry, we also found that this mutation is distributed all over Europe. And uh, we believe, we believe that it's also distributed in other, other areas. But so far, we can only show, uh, show this, this uh, data. But what happened in the US? What happened in America? Um, well, we, in 2014, we did some collaboration with a group based in Florida, and they sent us survivors from treatment to, uh, with uh, tau fuvalinate. They sent survivors uh, from mites collected in Florida and Georgia. And with these mites, we also uh, sequenced their genomes, and uh, we were looking for the European mutation. We were looking for this mutation because it was, it was the mutation we, we knew that was causing the resistance in Europe. But we didn't find, we didn't find this mutation in the American uh, mites. In, in, instead, we found two other mutations exactly in the same position. Mutation from leucine to isoleucine and from leucine to methion. These two mutations were actually causing resistance to uh, acaris, to uh, pyrethroids in uh, the US. At least in these samples, at, the, at that moment, at the very moment, 2014. But in collaboration with the group with, uh, by Dennis Van Egerdorf, we carried out a very large screening of uh, mites from all over the US. And we show a distribution, a complete distribution of the mutations and all the different genotypes that happen to uh, cause resistance. In uh, to, to the American to the American mites, we also did some other investigations, but I, I'm only wanting to show this today. If you want, we, we can discuss afterwards about this. But finding the mutations is just part of the story. It's the let's say the basic part of the story. It's the the, the part that is very interesting to me that I'm a biochemist and looking for mechanism of resistance, but we also develop diagnostic methodologies, very fast and accurate detection methods for uh, evaluating, for assessing the uh, frequency of resistant mites in populations. We can use almost any type of sample. I mean, I've, I've, I've been doing these assays uh, with mite collected after a week or maybe even more. In, at the bottom of the of the hive, and it was working pretty pretty well. This is a, a molecular test we call it Tacman, uh, and it's based in very simple uh, assumption that you have two alleles. One of them is resistant, and the other one is susceptible. And you use um, two segments of DNA labeled with fluorescence. One is a specific for the resistant allele, and the other one is a specific for the susceptible allele. And when we do the test, just to, to make this quick, we found, we usually find something like this. You have uh, on one side, the susceptible mites, the homozygous for the susceptible allele, that's why we have SS. Each of these dots is a different mite. We have single mites here, and all of them are grouped here. All of these mites are susceptible. And here you have the RR, which are the homozygous for the, uh, resistant allele, and in this case, we have here the mites surviving the treatment. These mites here are heterozygous, and because of the way of inheritance of the resistance, these mites are also uh, susceptible. I mean, almost heterozygous and the uh, homozygous with the susceptible allele, they are all um, susceptible, and these mites here are the only mites surviving the treatment. So with this information, we can actually know with high level of accuracy, the percentage, of, the percentage of mites that will be surviving a possible treatment with pyrethroids. Uh, this is, well, this is in Europe because it's, well, we only have one mutation. And this is the plot in using uh, American samples because we have two different mutations. So we have six different uh, genotypes and we can separate all of them which is, uh, let's say, is more complicated than from, from, from Europe, 
but it's also possible to do it. And, and we actually did this, as you, as you see, uh, as you saw before for America with samples. We, we did this with many, many, many samples from, from the US and it's very accurate too. So for Amitas, what we did for with Amitas, um, we also do the, we also did the same. But before moving forward, I will just um, focus here on the on the mode of action. Um, Amitas is binding to the dopamine receptor. The dopamine is the same as it's, it's, let's say it's for insects as adrenaline is for us. Um, so the dopamine binds to the receptor and it to uh, the function. So we have here amitrust, which is a very different molecule, but when amitrust gets into the organism, it's split in metabolites that is like very similar to dopamine. You see here, this is amitrust, this is a, the metabolite, metabolite of amitrust, and this is dopamine. They are quite similar. So amitrust is binding to the receptor and it's causing also neuroexcitation that is finally causing death of uh, the mite. So uh, back in 2009, we have received news from treatment failures in France. Uh, we have received this information from several uh, associations and we uh, asked them for samples from uh, treatment failures, the mites coming from uh, regions where the treatment fails, and also from regions where there were no treatment and the amitraz was actually infected. And we also received news from the US where you have, uh, well, when they have exactly the same issue, they have problems with uh, treatment failures in some areas of the United States. So, uh, what happened with the French sample? We ran our tests, we sequenced the dopamine receptor, uh, we did uh, a lot of work with these samples, and what we found? Well, we found a mutation, this is a change, uh, only a single change here of adenine for one in, that is changing uh, the amino acid from asparagine to serine at position 87 of the dopamine receptor. This octopamine receptor, there are several, there are several octopamine receptors, but we have, a, we, have a fine, we have found a change here in this receptor at this position that we call this here N87S, which is the, we call it the French mutation. And we found that this mutation is very, very prevalent in all the samples coming from treatment failure. And it was not present in the uh, samples coming from areas where the treatment was performed or carried out with oxalic acid uh, and there were no treatment work with amitraz for very, very long time. In the US, well, in the US, we, we did almost the same. We um, received samples for, very, for several uh, locations. And in this case, we found a mutation in the dopamine receptor in the beta dopamine receptor, I mean, the same receptor, but the mutation was in another position of this receptor. We found the mutation uh, in this case of tyrosine for histidine at position 215. Okay, this is again a single uh, nucleotide different uh, mutation for thymine to cytosine that is changing the amino acid from tyrosine to histidine. It's a very uh, important change, and we also detected that the mutation is highly prevalent in all those um, samples coming from regions where uh, the treatment was failing. Uh, it is this pink bars here. But remember the the assays we run with, for, for peripherates from 2016 and 2017. Well, we use some of these samples to detect that in those samples collected before, there were already mutation, although in a very uh, in a lower percentage. I mean, the mutation was already present in US samples from 2016, because we, we don't know from before, because we didn't have samples from before. This, if we 
at some point can make some analysis from samples collected before, maybe we will find if uh, uh, the mutation is actually uh, was actually present earlier in the country. Um, for this, we also develop a very similar assay. Just in this case, we use another uh, another uh, probes, another uh, DNA label probes, and uh, we can also be able to actually uh, genotype very uh, with a very high accuracy the resistant mites here from French mutations, so from sorry from French samples, and here from the U.S. Right? It's very very accurate and is um, let's say a straightforward methodology. Well, this is from France and the U.S. But in what happened in Alberta? I think you are very interested in, in to know what happened in, in, in Alberta, actually. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Rosol, Rosol, we received 93 samples of dead mites that were collected in several regions from Alberta. Uh, these um, samples were collected from inspection and also from resistance testing. Uh, they were collected in 2020 and 2022. And we run also our genotyping. Uh, I mean, we collect, we, go, we collect the samples, we, we get the samples from result, and we uh, start DNA from them, and we look for possible mutations. And we found exactly the same as in the US. I mean, the mutation we found in Canada is exactly the same as that we found in the US. It's uh, a change, again, from timid to citosine, that is producing a change from uh, tyrosine to histidine in the same position. I mean, it's the same mutation. Uh, and this is, let's say, the distribution we have. Um, we are, I mean, this is very, very recent data. I, um, we are still working on this. We are still working, and as you might understand, we really want this to, to be very, very clear before moving to publication. I'm showing you, I'm showing you this. I believe Russell is also going to show some of this information uh, to you. This is a, um, so several samples. Some the samples we received from 2020 and 2022. And as you can see here, we have some samples that we have no mutation at all. Uh, for example, this sample here is for sample 43. It's just coming from uh, a colony that was not treated with uh, amitras for a very, very long time. And as you can see, there is no, there is no mutation there. And, and also, they have all the samples where you have a very, very high percentage of the mutation. I mean, here, here in red is the RR, which is uh, the homocycle for the resistant allele. And if we believe that the mutation, this mutation is also recessive, these are the only mites. I mean, the red, these are the only mites that will survive the treatment. Okay. Uh, I believe that these samples are distributed for several regions in, in, in Alberta. And of course, you have a great deal of, of mutant mites in, in, in Alberta at the moment. Um, when was this uh, arriving to Alberta? We don't know. I don't know because I only have mites from 2020. Uh, I really don't know. I said, I said why, and sorry, I said why and when, because um, I don't know why you have these mites in, in, in Alberta. I mean, is this a, an independent mutation? or it's just a mutation that is coming from the US or is the other way around. So we don't know. It is something still we need to investigate uh, because we can do, we can do uh, research to actually know where is this mutation coming from. I mean, this is uh, arising in Canada. It was arising in the US. It's just something to, to investigate. It's just uh, the very beginning of this investigation. As I said, we have this, but the last results was from last week. Uh, and I'm just showing you this uh, highlight for you to, to see uh, where are we at the moment. 
Uh, we are verifying the mechanism. We are verifying, actually verifying the implication of each of this mutation in the uh, resistance to amitras. We are doing we are doing this with several several ways. I have to say that just a couple of days ago, we have a manuscript accepted in collaboration with uh, Frank Rinkiewicz from USDA, where we show actually that the mutation is actually associated with the resistance we found in the US, which is uh, support for our, for our data. But we are continuing with this uh, investigation in order to, to find out the actual role of each of this mutation in the uh, mechanism of resistance. Because we need to know is that if at some point there is a mix of populations, if you have and uh, you have the two mutations in the same population, what will be the level of resistance to uh, amitraz? This is something that is, is very important to know. And we are, uh, to say, committed to, to know what's going on. And just as a summary, because this is, uh, I don't want to uh, say to delay too much the presentation, I would like to uh, maybe uh, save time for discussion afterwards. We uh, found that the resistance to parithrus and amitraz is actually associated with the modification of the target sites. We know for sure that resistance has evolved independently in different locations. We still have to know if the resistance to amitraz in the US and in Canada is the same or not, but this is some work in progress. And uh, we have developed very robust and efficient um, diagnostic methodologies to uh, detect resistant mites. And of course, we, we believe that it's urgent need for IPM strategies, integrated pest, man pest management strategies for the better control of the mind. And I want to thank my colleagues from here, from the University of Valencia, that uh, they were working with me in this uh, project for, for a very long time. We also want to thank our sponsors, especially the regional government here in, in Valencia and the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and the Agriculture and Ministry of Science from, the, from Spain that uh, were funding our, our research. And also I want to thank all our collaborators in France, in the US, and also in Canada, especially Rasol that was uh, sending samples to us. And thanks to you for your attention today. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, this was uh, very, very interesting. And uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody learned a lot too. Um, maybe I will hold, uh, I'll wait to ask questions and to uh, read some of the questions that is already in the Q&A after Rasu and Sam have presented, just because some of those, um, maybe Sam and Rasu can, answer in their presentation some of the, the, those questions as well. Um, so after Sam and Rasu, we'll have um, time more like a round table to, to discuss those results. Um, Sam, uh, if you're ready, you could uh, yeah, share. Yeah, I'll share your screen here. Uh, okay. All right, do you see my screen? I do see your screen, yes. Okay, all right. Thank you uh, for having me and I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, you, a lot of people have joined today. I think it's really important. Um, we have had reports of resistance uh, or not resistance, but reduced efficacy. Um, beekeepers have been letting us know since I think 2019, probably 2018, just for your information as well, Joel. Um, and we started looking in 2019, we did some Pettis tests and, and the results were very inconsistent. So the following year, we did some work on uh, using um, Rasul, Dr. Rasul Bereni's method, the apiarium method. And it was just kind of a starting year. We, we had a lot of lessons learned from that experience. We had beekeepers mailing in samples. So uh, the samples were very consistent. The varroa mice rates are too high, too low. The bees were 
pretty sick on the way by the time they got to the lab because the samples were being mailed in. So in 2022, we did a, a project um, in conjunction with the tech transfer team. Um, basically, the tech transfer helped lead it. Uh, and we physically went out and went and tested uh, beekeepers colonies. Unfortunately, again, it was similar to the previous year in 2021, where we just couldn't get enough beekeeper like Basically, we had a really hard time finding my site year. So that I kind of want to make a point about too. These are kind of not the worst of the worst beekeepers by any stretch, but these are hives that just had mite levels that um, the beekeepers were concerned about. We had lots of beekeepers, probably five or six, I shouldn't say lots, five or six beekeepers call in that knew about the program. And they said, I have high viromite levels. Can you come test them? And then we would say, if you can mark the colonies that you want us to come out and test, we will come out and we'll grab those mites for you. And they could never find um, mite infestations high enough. So this is definitely not a random sampling. This is people, beekeepers reaching out to us saying that we have a problem. Can We just wanna know if APVAR is gonna work to get our viral mite levels down. So in total in uh, 2022, we were able to look at seven beekeepers. Um, we did 133 cages, so when we're in, in 26 colonies. So ideally, what we wanted for these was three or six cages per colony. So we had three controls. So they're in a cage. We have this little cages down to the bottom uh, left. And basically, we would put 300 bees in there. They'd be either surrounded by, there would be that where the clips are. Um, we would attach a either an apivar strip, which it was a determined size beforehand, or we would put it uh, just a plastic strip with no chemical. Basically, it's just a piece of plastic that you got for a report cover from Staples. So they weren't being exposed to any treatments. Um, any cages, so even when we went out to the hive and we sampled the hives and we're like, okay, the varomite levels are high enough to bring them back and do the test. If the cages once we ran the, the entire cage, um, the entire experiment, and there was less than 2% mite infestation, we just took those right out of, right out of the experiment. And ideally we wanted to go in and talk to beekeepers that had not put any treatments in their colonies uh, at that point, like for that particular point in the year. They may have treated in the spring, but this uh, took place in the fall. And we had two beekeepers that actually did have apivar strips in at the time. So of course that's going to um, most likely have killed the viable, if there was uh, viable mites in that population, it would have probably killed them at that point. So this is just kind of an overview of our 2022 finding of the seven beekeepers and the ones with the little asterisks, asterisks those folks are the ones that had the apivar strips in their colonies when they were sampled. We had one beekeeper um, that had 92% efficacy. And so I want to make uh, it clear too that we didn't look at mite kill. So we didn't, we, we compared our, basically compared the mite load before and after treatment to the control before and after treatment. So we could account for any bees that, or uh, mites that could, excuse me, um, died because they, the bees were either sick or, you know, maybe they had been a little, just basically wanted to compare the two so that it was efficacy and not might kill. Um, there is a distinct difference and Rasul might get into that as well. All right, so the 92%, that was a beekeeper. Actually, uh, Rasul's uh, mites, get mite yard that he had been working on. And these were these did come from a beekeeper that hadn't been using uh, treat any apivar for a period of time. Um, and the other ones were varying degrees of using, um, they, they had been using it, or in the case of beekeeper five and six, there was actually strips in the colony at the time. So overall, the average efficacy um, after the four hours in the apiarium was 44%. So of those seven beekeepers, average efficacy was 44%. If we took out Rasul's uh, results, it would have been even lower than that. So that was very concerning, particularly in the previous year, it was about 66%. But again, this just depends. This is the worst of the worst. We weren't just randomly sampling bees. And so um, if we hadn't included Rasul's results in that, um, yeah, 
that's why we need to kind of get out there and do a few more so that we do get a representative sample of what's going on across, not just folks that are concerned that they have an issue. So based on that, we kind of were talking about what now, and, and I think Joelle touched on this too, um, and it's just IPM. We have to start implementing a, a strict IPM program. Um, and that means monitoring, that means familiarizing yourself with controlled options that are currently available. We're not saying right now that uh, APVAR doesn't work. It's just, it works at varying levels. And so you have to approach your rural mites control strategies with that in mind. So know what you know your optimal conditions are, flash treatments versus slow ones. What are the application times? Are you doing it in the fall? Are you doing a mid-season treatment? Um, withdrawal period so that you're not contaminating your honey. And one thing we've been discussing quite a bit too is if you don't have time, you know, like it might be time to hire somebody that that's all they do is they're your IPM specialist. And when you think about how much an individual like that would cost versus losing 50% of your colonies, like we did, we did see that too in 2008 when we, when AB Stan and, um, Check might stopped working. We saw that really high winter kill, similar to what we saw last year. Um, so it is, and I'm not just talking about like I have to replace 50% of my hives. I'm talking about you treated a bunch of colonies that you didn't need to treat that ended up dying. You fed them. You had to clean all the dead outs out. You treated them not only with the APVAR strips, but the other treatments that you had to as well. So those are the things like the cost benefit analysis. It's definitely might be worth a while to get somebody in there. Um, we're also working with the tech transfer team and we got a bunch, we did get some funding. Um, so everybody that's like an active beekeeper in, in Alberta will be getting a Varroa mite shaker in the mail, along with a Varroa mite decision tree from the um, Alberta tech transfer program. We're also working on, or the tech transfer team is working on, so this isn't it, um, the Varroa mite integrated pest management plan. This isn't it. So this is going to be an example, we're going to be providing you guys a, an example of what an, uh, a monitoring program looks like. Like we always ask, are you monitoring? But we never really ask you, do you know what that actually looks like? Is it just monitoring twice, like taking a sample once a year or using a sticky trap or using the Varroa sh shaker? Um, are you looking before and after treatment? So those are the kinds of things that we're going to provide to you folks so that you can kind of take a look and get an idea of like, hey, maybe I should be implementing this into my, um, my, my uh, operation. We're also going to have the options that are currently available and the ideal times that like uh, ideal times that you could be using them. And so um, we're hoping to have these ready to go quite soon and they'll be getting mailed up hopefully uh, relatively soon so that when you guys are going out into the springtime, I know it's where I am at least, <laughs> there's snow on the ground and it's still pretty cold. So you're probably not digging into the brood to, to be taking samples at this point, but it can give you a general idea, but you can use sticky traps to put in the bottom, but an idea of what you should be looking at and when you should be making a move and the things to take, take into consideration when you're making these moves, like, okay, it's pretty cold right now, is oxalic acid gonna work for me? Or should I be looking at formic acid? Or should I maybe try um, hop guard or like, so we're gonna have all those things, all that information available to you and, and hopefully an easily digestible uh, format so that it makes making those decisions a little bit easier. And, um, if anybody wants any of the information or like our protocols that we use for the apiariums, um, sampling in the field, as well as this, it, everything we did in the lab, we have the protocols available and we're more than willing to share whatever information um, that you guys might need, just, uh, you know, just to see what we're actually up to. And I think that's about it for me. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of an over overview of what we found in our apiariums, uh, the efficacy. see. So that's using apiariums um, to estimate um, efficacy of treatment uh, compared to what Joel presented before 
on the genetic mutation, uh, which kind of goes hand in hand um, and possibly why we're seeing lower efficacy in the AP area. So that's very interesting to kind of see those, those two results side, side by side. Thanks, Sam. Um, now, Rasu, uh, if you want to share your screen, um, that would be nice to kind of see um, a final one to wrap up also all of this to kind of show the, the, the resistance. Uh, did you see my uh, slide? My screen? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, first, should we thank uh, uh, Joel to present very well. I learned a lot about the uh, resistance. I also thank uh, Renata to set up this presentation. So uh, I want to cover the uh, sub part of the presentation from Joel and Sam and explain what's happened the uh, AP bar resistance in Alberta. So uh, I'm Rasul Barini from Rupert's lab uh, in the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, University of Alberta. Uh, so uh, as we know that uh, we use uh, different chemicals like organic acid, essential oil, or synthetic chemicals like cumafus, phenylalanine, thalamitrin, emitras to control varva mite. But uh, there are some reports on development resistance to synthetic chemicals like emitras, phenylalanine, phenylalanine, and cumafus in different countries. So uh, because of that. In 2019, we started to develop a method to measure phenotypic resistance in uh, varva mite across the Alberta. And we collected the sample by uh, a tech transfer team collected that, or inspectors collected the mite samples, and we tested for phenotypic resistance. And then we, go, we went with the genotypic resistance. So uh, phenotypic resistance, as uh, Sam mentioned, we use the uh, apiario uh, to uh, measure the phenotypic resistance in the mite. After that, we collected the mite from the province and sent to the Joel in Spain to uh, explore the resistance, genotypic resistance in our mite in uh, Alberta. So uh, I, I should show the, this graph that Sam used that. So, uh, yeah, we tested the mice and we found that some uh, uh, beekeepers, mice, they have a very, re uh, they are resistance. They show their low efficacy in compared just one sample from my colony with a high efficacy. So uh, we collected the mice from those beekeepers, from those uh, apiary and sent to the joel for uh, testing uh, genotypes. The results show that uh, this uh, sample uh, from beekeeper uh, or appear number 567 that show average of 30 or 40 percent uh, efficacy, they had around 95 or 90 percent uh, amistrous resistance genotype. In compared to the, that sample that uh, with the 92 percent uh, efficacy in apiarium test showed around the uh, I can say that for 50-50 percent emitras susceptible and emitras. But uh, this sample size is still a small. We are working on that to collect more samples to find a correlation between uh, phenotypic resistance and genotypic resistance in uh, our mind in Alberta. Uh, so uh, we continue also collected the sample uh, through the Alberta and uh, we tested the genotype of the resistance or susceptible in the mice in the different uh, apiary. This graph already Joel showed that, and when I explain a little bit about that. So as uh, we know that some uh, beekeepers, they have a, a almost 90 or 100% uh, susceptible. We are now uh, looking for the how it's happened in the, this apiary in compared to the, for example, 19, uh, 18, 19 and 2021 sample a beekeeper sample that uh, they show almost 95% resistance. What's the difference between them? Is any difference between the practices to control mite or uh, they, this uh, beekeeper use only oxalic acid or this use consists only on AP bar? So for now, we are, collect, uh, we are going to collect the information from these beekeepers to find uh, a strong correlation between development of the resistance in the mite and the treatment, history of treatment in the apiary. 
So uh, this graph also show us, uh, I can say a good news and bad news. Bad news is that we have a mitra's resistance in Alberta, we should be careful about that. But the good news in the sum apiary, uh, still uh, we have a 50% uh, susceptible mites in, in these samples. Uh, so it's been that uh, still we have a time to control development of Amitra's resistance in Alberta and should be find the best IPM uh, method, you know, to, uh, to uh, minimize the development of resistance in Alberta. So uh, for uh, next graph, I think there is a, is, I love that. Uh, this graph, slide show the Alberta map with the, uh, uh, distribution of the susceptible and resistance in Alberta, the sample that we collected. So uh, we collected almost 93, I think, a sample, but so far we tested uh, 20, 20 something a sample for the genotypic resistance. So you can see that the some circle is completely uh, green uh, in the north, uh, around the Edmonton or Calgary or uh, Grand Prairie. Those represented that beekeeper uh, had uh, completely 100% susceptible genotype. Some circle, uh, for example, this one or this area, and also Midsand Hat and Lethbridge show the resistance. It means that, that that sample showed 100% resistance to emitters. Otherwise, some sample had an overlap between green and red. It means that they have a mix of the both genotypes. So, uh, first of all, I should be say this uh, circle, this uh, symbol, uh, actually don't show the exactly place of the uh, AP area, uh, AP, sorry, the beekeeper's place. Just I put it the circle to know that around the Edmonton, we have a resistance around the Calgary Lethbridge and Peace River and Grand Prairie. So we go to publish the data and we will release the exact uh, and more detail about the, this sample. So this, uh, map show us that we have a resistance genotype almost uh, separated all around the province. And we must be uh, work on that to have uh, more samples. And if you have a beekeeper in the, that area, the clear area, uh, it doesn't mean that you are, uh, you are susceptible resistant. It means that we don't have a sample from that area and we don't know how, what happened. Uh, otherwise, this sample we collected most of the sample from 22, uh, 2020 and 2022. After two, three years, uh, we don't know at this point, at this year, what's happened. Is resistance genotype developed and uh, spread more in the Alberta or no? And we are going to work on that with uh, Joel and the uh, tech team and the government of Alberta to know more uh, resistance development. And as uh, Joel mentioned, our uh, resistance genotype or mutation is the American mutation. It means that so far we found a, a mutation very close to the uh, mutation that already found in the state. But we are looking maybe in the Canada or in Alberta, we have a new mutation we can call the Alberta mutation or Canadian mutation. We don't know, we have to work on that to uh, analyze the more samples uh, to find the new mutation or uh, another thing in the Alberta. Otherwise, I think uh, this is a good model for another provinces if they want to do the, the same method uh, to collect the sample and analyze the uh, genotypic resistance on the mite. So uh, let me uh, wrap up with the uh, history of the uh, mite side or warrior side that we have in Canada. In 1993, Apistan approved by PMRA and introduced it in the market. In uh, 20, uh, 2002, uh, Checkmite uh, came to the market. Uh, some years after, almost six years, APWAR has uh, introduced it in the market. And finally, Bivarol came to the market for beekeepers in 2016. So from the almost uh, more than uh, 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, we have a for a uh, uh, warrior side or mighty side in the market to control might. But there are some reports to re resistance development or resistance happened in the mites against uh, this uh, uh, product. So there are two uh, things that I show here, uh, 
PR is the phenotypic resistance and GR is the genotypic resistance. So after 11 years, there was a report uh, on the epistone resistance in Canada. It means that the epistone only worked for the 11 years. But uh, interesting, check my one year after it uh, uh, came to market, check my resistance developed uh, reported, I think in Ontario, some, uh, some uh, provinces in the Eastern Canada one year after. But for APWAR, we found the genotypic and uh, phenotypic resistance after 15 years, but uh, maybe 15, I'm not right. I say the 15 years because we collected the sample earlier and we don't know, maybe we had the APWAR resistance before this year. But for now, we are gonna officially report it that is mean that 15 years after that, APWAR showed the resistance. For bivarol, uh, there's a, some report that bivalve is not working or have a low efficacy. And uh, we still, we have to work on that to confirm the genotype resistance on bivarol and also those products, Checkmite and Epistone. But for bivarol, almost I can say seven years or less than seven years uh, resistance reported for bivarol. So this is a, a, a good, uh, you know, imagine uh, a picture of the how what's happened in Canada. We have a four, uh, mighty side that all of them, uh, we have a resistance to that and then maybe they are not working. We have to uh, looking for the new product or uh, develop the, our IPM. Uh, so at the end, I wanna just say my, some uh, recommendation to how we can manage the verbal resistance. First, as Sam mentioned, should we monitor the mite level before and after treatment? Is a very, very helpful for beekeepers to know that if you, Treated your colonies with the oxalic acid formic or AP or AP sun, anything, please go and after treatment, take a sample to be sure that the mite uh, level drop to under uh, economic threshold or mite level is very, very low for you. And rotate us with a soft uh, virus like uh, oxalic acid and formic acid, replace the old combs because there are some residue of the uh, pesticide in the old combs. Uh, can help the mice to develop the resistance genes in their body. Also use the mites with different mode of action, minimize the spread of the resistance gene. If, uh, still I don't know, if we bring the, uh, some uh, package bees or bee product from the another countries, maybe we imported the resistance gene to Canada, still we do not, we have to confirm that. But if you uh, sell or purchase, you know, uh, package bees with the mite, you should be tested that the mite, they are not resistant. And please go do a resistance test by yourself or say, uh, you know, by aperium or send the sample to the lab to do the resistance for you. Uh, at the end, I should be thank uh, Joel and his team from the Valencia University, University of Alberta, Government of Alberta and Tectress Film team uh, from Alberta that help us to uh, run the, this uh, study. And this study is the first time I think in Canada. And I hope we can do the, the same in another provinces. And thank you for attention. And I'm ready for a uh, question. Thank you very much, Rasu. Um, let me start my video. I think that we kind of now wraps up everything. Um, that was kind of our goal was to kind of um, give a, a nice picture of what we found, at least for Alberta. Um, and I think you ended in a nice note that uh, we do hope to see how spread out um, these, what we found here in Alberta. Um, it's true for Canada as well. Um, now I would like, well, first of all, I would like to thank all three of you for your time and for sharing um, what you have found, your research, your data. Um, we, we, we really appreciate and uh, they have it's been amazing presentations by all three of you. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to open um, then I guess the floor for questions. Um, we do have a few questions already in the Q&A and I know we have um, a few questions in the chat as well. So I, I will try to, to look at both um, and see, um, I will start with the, the, the Q&A ones. 
Um, I think you sort of answered the first one, Rasu, from Douglas about the behavioral that it's not sure yet, um, but there has been some um, some data showing that we might be we might dealing with some behavioral resistance. Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah, for viral, uh, there's a report, I think, from Ontario, uh, Morphine et al. 2022. And also we tested in 2019. Still, uh, we don't, pub uh, we are going to publish the data from Alberta. Uh, yeah, viral is not working very well. And uh, there's uh, some reports on the phenotypic resistance. But for genotypic resistance, we don't know yet. And uh, maybe we go to test that. Can I just okay. add something? Can I add something to this? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we, we didn't test any sample from Canada, uh, but we have uh, tested uh, samples from some regions where uh, the mutation is the same for um, viral and Abistan. I mean, even if you, you treat with Abistan or with viral, the mutation is the same. It's just as I mentioned before, they, they, they both bind the same the same target with voltage gated solving channel. And so the, at the moment we have um, found no big differences in the frequency of mutations when you do, when you do treatment with viral or with Apistar. It's almost the same. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we are about to publish some uh, data for electrophysiology where we have found that the mutation is actually cost resistant to both of them. The limitation to Abistan is cost the system to viral. That's why you have this um, chart you show, Russell, that you have a, it was 15 years until you have resistance to Abistan, a very short time you have resistance to, to viral. It's because of that. Because when yeah. you stop using Abistan, then the population recovers because we have we have shown there is uh, this recovery of the population uh, because of this is a fitness cost of the resistance. And then uh, when you uh, use viral, you are just selecting again the mites resistance, resistant to uh, Abistan, which because they share the same mechanism. That's why it's almost the same. And uh, Joel, I think uh, you are uh, explaining us about the uh, reverse resistance. It means that if we stop the some mighty side for uh, some years, mm -hmm. you know, the resistance uh, frequency go down. Mm -hmm. I'm right? I, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't show too much data on that because I didn't want to let's say overload this with, with data and with information. But we have already, we have uh, in fact published some of this uh, before, and there is also a paper um, from a long time ago by uh, some Ital Italian researcher that they have found that after three years they recover complete susceptibility uh, of um, abstract resistant uh, mites. In Abistan resistant mites, after three years, they found that they com recovered complete susceptibility. We have very curious data that we published in 2018, but in only one year, when you stop the, the treatment, you uh, recover very high percentage of susceptibility in a single population, which is quite, quite mm -hmm. interesting. And it was also working the other way around. When you treat with uh, Abistan, for example, you have a very high increase in the frequency of resistant mites just in the next uh, generation. It's, uh, there is a very high fitness cost of the resistance to barithrate. When you stop the treatment, it's very likely that you will recover uh, susceptibility in, in some time. Uh, what about the emitras? Emitras happen like this? We don't know yet. We believe, we believe it should be, but we don't know yet. We have to, we have to prove it. Still, we, ha we have no information about this yet because we, we really need to, to do the test. Um, Joel, Patricia is asking, Patricia Vega is asking, uh, ideally how many mites must be tested per colony and what about apiary levels? Well, it, that depends. I mean, um, if you really want, we, we have been doing this because it's, it's a very interesting question because it's something that is just uh, passing us for some time. We find out that testing 40 mites per colony, it would be enough to actually say, let's say, mm, 
to have a proxy, very good proxy of the uh, frequency of resistant mites or susceptible mites in the colony. Just with 40 mites, we believe this is enough. Uh, we have been doing some tests, apparently with this amount of mites is enough. Uh, we, you can do lower than that, but we believe that 40 is, is okay. Uh, I'm talking about the apiary, that's, that's a more tricky question. Because I don't know in Canada, but here in Spain, we have a lot of migratory beekeeping. I mean, uh, beekeepers are moving colonies all around the country, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the time of the year. And uh, they, they put all the colonies together again. So if you do this, it's very difficult to actually say how many colonies per this apiary you can test because uh, they are not actually uh, an apiary. <laughs> You say different apiaries because they were moving all around and they're getting, let's say, inputs from different places. So, if this is the case, it's very, very difficult. If you have a, an apiary that is not moving uh, for a long time, then mites in this apiary are very similar, are very, very similar, all of them. And, and then we believe that if it depends on the number of hives, but we say that. Testing one out of 10 colonies, it will be enough to have a pretty good picture of the apiary. But as I said, again, saying if it is an apiary, it's formed by colonies that they are not moving all over, all over the place. Yeah, so stationary colonies, yeah. yeah. Okay. And are you still trying to draw the correlation or the connect between the frequency found and um, does that mean we we should stop using like at what what frequency we consider APs are like ineffective? Oh uh, well, that's uh, something that we as I said we, we are still in in that moment that we are going trying to to actually figure out exactly what is the frequency of resistant mites genetic resistant mites that how to, let's say, translate this into the colony level. Because for, for pyrethroids, we, we have found a very good correlation. I mean, if you have, let's say, 50% resistant mites in, in, a, in a colony, then you have uh, minus 10, minus, well, plus and minus 10% error, uh, and you have a very good, uh, let's say, proxy of the efficacy. When you have 50%, you usually you have around 50 to 60% uh, percent efficacy okay. of, of, in, in your economy. But for our class, we still need to do some work on this. In fact, the, the, the paper we, we just got accepted is trying to do something about this. It will be released in, in a few days. It was accepted just at, at the beginning of this week. Yeah, okay. Um... So I think you kind of answered the another question here when you uh, answered the the efficacy the frequency now. Um, now now uh, Paul um, Paul Kozak has a question about the bioassays um, like the apiarium uh, assays I believe that Sam presented. So now that we know we can we can do genetic tests to check at mutations as well. Um, how important and useful are the bioassays at this time? And where does this fit in with how resistance should be sampled, how, should be sampled right now? How we should do resist, how should we sample for resistance, I guess? Yeah, and I think until we kind of know how the frequency correlates to the efficacy, we'll probably still be kind of utilizing both. And I mean, by utilizing both, we'll be able to kind of make more of that connection, I would imagine. So I think that's, after hearing this talk, that's definitely something, you know, we're going to have to um, take into consideration moving forward. Okay. Um, I think we already answered, um, Joel already answered Douglas' questions on um, does we have any reason to believe that amitraz resistance can decline over time if generations are not exposed to the chemical? And Joel kind of answered that, that we don't know necessarily yet, but we're hoping to, to answer that um, with more tests, I guess. 
Um, yeah, just, just can I add just something to this? It's just that yeah. uh, why I'm saying this. I'm saying this because we, we still need to test it. But given the nature of the, the, the mutation, it's just a mutation that is in the receptor. So usually, usually this kind of mutation is causing some kind of impairment of um, the behavior of uh, the reproduction of the mites. It's just making them less uh, uh, able, just to talk like this, uh, in comparison with the receptacle mites. So if you withdraw, the, the treatment, if you uh, stop the treatment, then the susceptible mites will be more, uh, do have more likelihood of, for reproduction. And that's why you will have more, uh, an increase in the uh, level of susceptible mites in a colony when you stop the treatment. But that is something that is just an assumption at the moment. We still need to prove it. Yeah. Um. Dale has a question on how consistent are the formulations and strength of the treatments in different countries? As in, are there higher strengths in use in some countries than Canada? Um, I'm assuming they're talking about uh, APVAR. Um, and in, I mean, APVAR, there's only, well, I will let you guys uh, answer that question. Uh, and I would say as far as I know there's no difference the only difference I think I've heard is that uh, in Europe they might leave the strips and they recommend leaving them in for a bit longer so we say 42 to I think 56 days and there and I saw on a label like it's just 56 days and they say uh, they have other like you know scrape the strips they have more detailed about and and strip placement and stuff like that so but they, in, in the European label, they're like, scrape the strips clean. And when, if you notice that there's a buildup of wax, but I did not notice that on ours. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the most country that use the AP or APSAN, they follow the manufacturer's the instruction and it's suited the same to uh, like uh, for AP or two esters for the full size colony, like this for uh, six or eight weeks. I think the most the people, they, they follow that same method. As far as I know, it's the same here in Spain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there, um, there's a question from Paul uh, for you, Sam, on the chat, asking about varroa treatment and sampling, um, asking if we have made this too simple for beekeepers in the past, as in there's an expectation from some beekeepers they just want something that works at, um, let's say, 90% or above efficacy and don't have time to monitor? Um, I don't know if there's been an expectation that it's 90%. I think, you know, the treatments come up, like any sort of thing that comes out in the market, you just assume it's going to do what it's, you know, you, you're like, okay, I'm going to put formic acid in my hive and it's going to kill my mites. And no, people don't necessarily know that uh, it's actually dependent on a, a few different things and it's temperature dependent and if you don't get the right conditions you might not get necessarily get the kill you want. I, so I guess there is an expectation or maybe it's not an expectation but a lack of maybe a lack of knowledge of how the products uh, work. Um, but I do I do think like the way we beekeep now is is drastically changing when you know, obviously, and I think every beekeeper will say that you can't just go out and put honey supers on anymore and just worry about treatments in the spring and the fall and get them in when you can get them in because you're busy with other things like it has to be forefront um, in your mind before the, the season even starts or and before the season even finishes. Um. Hussein is asking, um, the reduced efficacy of APVAR may lead to increased use of oxalic acid. Has there been any indication of oxalic acid resistance or is it expected to develop based on what we know about the mechanism of action or do we, do we still not know the mechanism? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, so far there is no any resistance reported for the uh, organic acid or essential oil. We don't know that. 
And I still we don't know actually what's the resistance mechanisms maybe happened for the oxalic acid. I mean, the mechanism of action is not known. It's just an acid, and and it's, it's, it is believed that it's a physical, it's a physical uh, um, action uh, because it's acid, and and that's why it's very unlikely that, that there is a, a at least high level of resistance. But there are some mechanism of resistance. There is a mechanism of resistance that is a, a hardening of the cuticula in some insects that is might be causing some resistance to uh, uh, these uh, organic acids, but it's something that is usually very low level of resistance. Uh, I don't expect this to, to be very high, but it's just, as, as you just said, as always very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, unlikely to, this to happen. Okay. Um, so the, Gabriela asked a question on the Q&A. Would you be able to type that in? So I think it's easier um, to type the, the formula than, than you try to explain it. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, it's, um, it is the mean abundance of the control and the mean abundance of the mites before and after treatment. And Rasul, you know the, the equation. It's got an, it's the, I can't, it's not coming off the top of my head. The, uh, uh, actually, I think uh, it's published too, isn't it? Yeah, in your paper, yeah. Or I will share that. Yeah, you know that the most uh, yeah. papers the uh, use the dead mice or uh, percentage of the mite mortality and report as a resistance. This is not resistance or efficacy. So for efficacy in the our study, we use the we actually adopted from agriculture another sector of the agriculture. We measure how density or abundance of the mite change in the treatment compared to the control. We don't go exactly with, you know, just the mite mortality, which uh, we measure the uh, abundance, mite abundance or density, how change. Yeah, uh, we published that. I will share here in the chat. And yeah, Thank uh, you very we, much, yeah and we got the formula from uh, Henderson title 1955, I think, 1955, like this, yeah. Okay. Um, what resistance data has Kappa seen in American bees? In talking directly to Americans who are using Tactic, um, um, I believe most people know what Tactic is. Well, if, if not, Tactic is just a, an illegal, um, um, well, it's not approved for, for use it in honeybee colonies, but it's an Amitras product, a uh, high concentration of uh, Amitras compared to Apivar. Um, and it's saying associations have been asking for these data. Um, I, um, I'll i let you guys answer. Oh, sorry. So do we, I, as far as I know, the US other than um, collecting, like I don't think they have state programs or anything to look at that sort of thing. Um, from, when I've talked to the apiculturist inspectors of America, they it was all just like, oh yeah, everybody just uses it. Um, but uh, one thing I, I would just say about um, off use label is there's a huge, there's huge human health implications and you put yourself and your staff at risk when you're using those sorts of things. And uh, like, it's an uncontrolled method. It's a, like, is it a flash versus a, a long-term? Um, the impact that could be on your honey quality or leaving residues in your wax, because you do have to take in, into considering, in consideration the metabolites as well, not just uh, the amitraz, um, that's the active ingredient. So, um, Actually, that stuff really frightens me that people are using that just from the human health uh, perspective, especially when you're probably not 100% sure about what dosages you're putting in or how long it's active. Those, those sorts of things are quite terrifying to me. Um, I want to I wanna maybe ask Joel um, something on, on this topic. Um, so the, a lot, some beekeepers, um, as uh, pointed out, but this person I use uh, tactic. Um, and when we're talking about genetic mutations, uh, like you said, so the mite has developed, has evolved this mutation. 
uh, where the receptor now um, it's it becomes resist that might becomes resistant because he doesn't attach like he cannot uh, attach to that receptor anymore. Wouldn't that be true for any? Amitraz product, then either APVAR or Tactic. So it doesn't matter the concentration in that case, um, it would still be resistant. Uh, well, this is a very interesting question because, I mean, uh, the concentration is something to bear in mind. Of course, concentration is something important. I mean, there are some mutations, you know, I'm talking about uh, in general now for resistance. Uh, you have some populations that you have you have resistance to a certain level of pesticide, but if you put too much, maybe you are uh, you succeed killing killing the the, the the insects or the mites in this case. Uh, the concentration matters, but again, it depends because when you have a mutation that is uh, let's say striking in a way where the active ingredient is not able to bind in any case, it, the level of resistance is very, very high. We still need to prove that for amitraz to system mutation that we found. We still need to prove that. But given that this is a modification of the target site, it's possible that the level of resistance is high, but we still need to prove it. Thank you. Um... Do we recommend using more than one product at a time? I would not recommend this in any time. <laughs> I have this question sometimes, <laughs> and I would not recommend this in any time. I mean, I would, I do recommend to do rotation, definitely. You really need to do that, but never to mix two, two products at the same time. That's my recommendation. I, I, I don't, I would never recommend other things. Yeah, and I would uh, add that uh, we should always follow the label instructions um, and uh, understand that chemicals have synergistic effect and uh, they can add as well. There's an additive effect. These are pesticides. Um, so just be very careful when you're putting two pesticides together at the same time. The effect can, um, can, can be very detrimental and, and dangerous. Um, so do do follow the label, do re read the label um, when you um, choosing and applying pesticides in your colonies. Um, uh, Dale is asking if has there been testing of mutable treatments like APVAR and Thymovar applied together to enhance effectiveness? I believe that's the same kind of kind of question um, that we just we just answered. Um, it's not recommended to apply treatments together. Um, Sam, uh, Murray is asking, uh, what is the status of shop towels, um, the glycerin and, and oxalic acid application? Um, what is the status right now? I will be approved soon. Um, is it in progress? Actually, oh, yeah, um, Paul Kozak's on mute, but I know the uh, tech transfer lead in Ontario, as far as I know, they put a pre-submission in for the, uh, to change the label for use so that uh, oxalic acid can be used, uh, applied in a different way. And so it's in the, basically it goes to CFIA, or sorry, PMRA, they say, okay, this is, this is good, or we need more data. Um, this is the fast route. And then once they get back to us, then we'll get them everything they need, or if they don't need anything more, we'll officially submit it. But this isn't something that's gonna happen right away from my understanding. It could be another year or two down the road now that it's in the CFIA. And again, it depends on if what other information CFIA uh, needs, for, or sorry, PMRA keeps saying CFIA. Um, they might need information on, uh, because we're using glycerol to put in, they might need more information on if that leaves residues in the honey. Right now, I think the honey was tested to see if there was uh, oxalic acid residues, but not necessarily um, glycerol. So that's one thing that they could ask for more data from. And as far as I know, we, we, we may be able to access that data, but it, it just depends on what more information they need. That's gonna determine how long it takes. 
Thank you, Sam. And I see that Paul and Colette have added um, more comments to this question. So um, please look at the chat. To, they they have added some um, good comments to answer that question as well. Mm -hmm. um, one question here in the chat, um, Tracy is asking if there are any plans to sample wax from beekeepers with resistant mites for DPMF. Um, rotating treatments now may not work if there are DPMF residues in wax. Rotating out old combs may be really important if DPMF lingers in comb for a long time. That, that has been something that our team has been discussing and, and maybe not necessarily even for, like for, for D, Amitraz, the breakdown products, and also maybe for some other uh, chemicals. Uh, so maybe um, Kumafos, Avistan residue, or Avistan, so the Pyrese, those sorts of things we might also check. Um, Cause this might also be like a good, uh, message to us that, hey, we got to really start rotating out those frames. Not to mention all the other stuff that the, the bees are bringing back into the colony that aren't things that we're directly placing in there. So, I mean, maybe we, like, it would be nice to test those to see kind of what we find so that, you know, maybe it's a bit more of an eye opener to all of us. I, I, it, it was particularly not even just the wax, but also the honey, because like you say, the chronic effects of these bees being um, exposed to these. So like AP stand, for example, um, if a beekeeper used it for many, many years, there might still be residues in that comb if they haven't cycled it out. So even though you're like, oh, I'm gonna use AP stand again, I haven't used it for like six or seven years, it might, you might still have resistant mites because they're being exposed to it. Uh, yeah, I want to add that to this uh, question. Very good question. Yeah, if we have uh, old combs, you know, with the residue of the mighty side, uh, still, you know, uh, mice exposed to the uh, chemicals and uh, leads to the development resistance. So, but if beekeepers want to test that their, you know, the wax, old wax, if there is a uh, residue of the chemicals, there's a lab in the University of Guelph, they can uh, test the residue. But uh, Actually, last year I did some uh, residual test in my colony, not for the AP, but for the new uh, compound. Uh, it's very expensive. Um, so Andrew has a question um, on the LD50. Uh, can any of the scientists speak on their science to the fact that we are trying to kill a bug on a bug? Uh, it's not the poison, but the dosage. Can you repeat the question? Um, LD50, can any of the scientists speak on their science to the fact that we are trying to kill a bug on a bug? It's not the poison, but the dosage. Um, I guess, you may, Andrew, maybe you, you could uh, try to reword um, that question. I'm assuming it, it's, somewhat in the same line that we talked about concentration of uh, the the chemical before. Yeah, maybe I can say something about this. It's, it's, I would think I, I think I might understand what, what she, she, she wants to, uh, to know. Uh, definitely it's true. We have a Baroa, which is a mite, and we have a B that is an insect. Uh, and of course we are using a, a poison. Uh, that is uh, something that might be killing, uh, might be killing uh, both of them. It, de it depends on the concentration, definitely. There are many, many studies done with other insects, and for example, with uh, natural enemies used for uh, biological control. And because you, you really need sometimes to maintain the natural control, uh, uh, the natural enemies alive, while at the same time killing the pest. And that's why you study the, the determinants for specificity. And the thing is that uh, the bees have a very sometimes different detoxification routes uh, than, to, for example, the mites. And that's why some compounds are making, let's say, uh, producing more effects on the mites than on the bees and the other way around. 
So it's just that you really need to, to use the exact compound at, at the right concentration in order to keep this balance, just to kill the mites in higher frequency than killing the bees. That's, I think that's the question Chi Chi made, but uh, that's my understanding of how these things work. And there's a lot of work on this because it's very important to actually maintain this difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about once these strips are done? Um, is the rec I, I, I believe that's kind of the question. Is the recommendation to use oxalic acid? So what about when APs APVAR is not working? Would you recommend then oxalic acid use? Um, you have to know what's best for your operation with the tools that are available. So you have to know, is there still brood in the hive? If there is, oxalic acid is gonna, is, isn't going to be as effective. Um, the temperature outside, like maybe you can use formic acid. You know your operation better than we do. So I can't, I, I would never honestly make a recommendation um, without knowing all the factors that are involved beforehand. Um, and, and that's why we're like monitoring it, how why monitoring is so important before too. So um, maybe that's where you send samples in beforehand to see if you should even go down the path of, uh, maybe you should do formic acid instead of using ABVAR, maybe check to see if there's resistance. Um, do an apiarium test or ask, uh, send some samples to the lab for diagnosis to see if the, the, the mutation is in your operation. And if it's a very high frequency, like we're seeing in some of the operations, then maybe it's not a good idea to be using that. But uh, honestly, I, I think we have to be a little bit, we can't just say, okay, well, if, if I'm, if it doesn't work, what can what else like can I just follow it up with something we just before we even get to that point we have to kind of make a more informed decision thank you Sam. But, yeah and by the time you're using AB, uh, oxalic acid if the APVAR hasn't worked the damage might be too already too far gone um, to even you could drop the mite population but you're still going to have viruses that you have to contend with your winter bees are going to be affected because I assume this is probably going to happen in the fall so yeah, these are the things you need to take into consideration. Yeah, I want to add this uh, because in uh, Alberta condition, if you, for example, put the APVAR in the colony in end of August or early September, you have to wait six or eight weeks. Is it uh, October or November? November, I can say so late to use oxalic acid because they might damage to the bees, to the winter bees. Yeah. yeah. So it's better yeah, okay. to be for, yeah, uh, pick the uh, treatment, please check that their resistance. Yeah. Um, one last question to wrap up our webinar um, is from Murray. What is recommend? What is recommended dosage of oxalic acid vaporization per ten frame deep is two grams minimal based on Dr. Cameron research. What is recommended frequency of application uh, if brood is present, assuming a mite problem exists? I don't know yeah. if you want to comment on that, Russell. That's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Cameron J. Uh, he did a, a test in Florida. Florida is completely different than us, and uh, yeah, he found that uh, uh, one gram of the you know the one gram of the oxalic acid in the most of the vaporizer is not working. Must be increased to the two grams. And I know that the, our partner or uh, researcher in the they're searching the estate, they are working, you know, to change their label from the one, maybe more than one gram. But uh, in the Canada, we don't know yet this. And I think we should be uh, follow the instruction for each uh, a machine if you use a bazooka, the large one or the Prova. Prova, but still, I think uh, they say the one gram, but maybe it's not enough. I cannot say answer right now because we didn't test it in Alberta. Okay, um, Nana had to leave quickly, but there's one last, last question. Um, have the scientists also done side-by-side -side genetic testing on possible mutations to the bees? No, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. We were just focusing on, on the mites. 
on these <clears throat> studies because we would like to see the mechanism of resistance of the mites. So we didn't do any tests on, on, on the bees. Okay, hey, well, awesome. Thank you everyone for coming, Sam, Joel, and Sam Vasul. Um, we appreciate your talk. It's been a very interesting webinar. There's been lots of interest in it. It's one of our most popular webinars. Um, just to mention as well, we did record this and we'll be posting it on our TTP YouTube website. So thanks again, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Joel. Bye. Bye-bye.